Um, I guess just to start, um, this article that we're doing is about the master's workshop you were doing at the Art of Music Festival. And yeah. um, for you, as someone who's now hosting a master's level workshop, where does it all begin for you of how you learned and who you learned it from and what they told you or taught you? Um, sure. So uh, I uh, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, there's a... Uh, there's a place in Chicago called the Old Town School of Folk Music that's kind of been the nucleus of the Chicago folk music scene for decades. Um, and um, I kind of stumbled into learning the banjo because my brother uh, started taking mandolin lessons. He heard a mandolin player at his school and, and wanted to take mandolin lessons. And after a few years, I got kind of jealous with his... Um, jealous of his hobby and I wanted to learn an instrument as well and my parents just suggested the banjo and I thought okay why not so I didn't have like a crystallized moment where yeah. I heard the sound of the banjo that made me want to choose it um, and so I started taking lessons there but I I, uh, I first uh, was pursuing the banjo in the claw hammer or frailing style um, like kind of the old time banjo style open back where yeah. you're not wearing finger picks and um that that was kind of my my little hobby playing banjo for a couple of years, and that all changed when I first heard Bela Fleck. Yeah. Um, and I heard his record. The first time I heard Bela Fleck was on a record of his with the Fleck tones, and you can imagine the impact that had on on a, like a ten year old kid, nine yeah. year old kid, to hear these sounds coming out of the instrument. And um, frankly, I just didn't believe that he was like playing the same type of banjo as Earl Scruggs was playing. Yeah. You know, I, I thought, no, there's no way he's playing in the three finger style. There's no way he's playing a Gibson banjo. And I wanted to see with my, my own two eyes, um, how he was pulling that off. And I went and saw him play, um, at Navy Pier in Chicago and saw, Oh, he is holding an old Gibson master tone banjo and he's using three finger picks and kind of has created this new style. Um, uh, springboarded out of the, you know, everything that Earl Scruggs had, had, had created and all the other pioneers of the banjo. And so, um, I wanted to learn how to do that, but everybody told me, you know, you got to start with bluegrass if you want to ever be able to play the, the more progressive stuff. That's how Bale Flex started. That's how Tony Triska started. You know, all of the, the real progressive masters all had a um, all cut their teeth on, on bluegrass and Earl Scruggs first. And so I heeded the advice of all those people in the early days and, and started playing and learning bluegrass. And um, I really got caught up um, with bluegrass and kind of lost sight of the original um, goal of, like, you know, playing jazz on the banjo. Yeah. And it was kind of later, you know, within the last 15 years or so that I started gravitating towards more progressive bands and found, you know, found myself more useful in um, kind of more eclectic uh, scenarios than within traditional bluegrass um, bands. I felt like I had more, more to offer um, bands playing kind of a more wide ranging uh, list of material than uh, stuff that was pretty traditional. Yeah, well, um, it's more like instead so, of uh, A to B, it's A to B to C. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you know, when I when I do these workshops, the you know the overarching um, thing that I, I I try to implore is is that it's important not to be a banjo player first and a musician second, but it's important to approach the banjo as a good musician. And I think it's real easy for people to get caught up with the idiosyncrasies of their instruments and you kind of focus on, you know, playing the banjo it almost like a, it just becomes like this, this routine of, of notes one after e each other. And at the end, you, a song is sounded, but it's, you're not playing music. You're almost just operating the instrument almost as if it's, as if it's a video game or something like that. Yeah. And what I think has been most helpful to me over the years being around um, some really world-class musicians is trying to just take some overarching concepts of good musicianship and um, fold that into um, my pursuits as a banjo player. So when I, when I, 
teach these workshops. I, I try to um, kind of open the door for people to think about the, the instrument a little bit more holistically um, and to just to use your intuition and, and your ear to be able to kind of aid whatever, you know, practice or performance on the instrument that, that you're um, involved with. Well, it's one of those things, too, where I would say that you could learn all the technical uh, wizardry that, that's in any book or any uh, person that you're studying, but at the end of the day, it's all about learning how to let go. Right. Um, I think, you know, like the, I think it, the most rewarding music, musical experiences are organic and are human, and they're centered around the exchange of ideas or emotion with, you know, your fellow musicians or with your audience. Yeah. And, you know, I think there, there are virtuosos in the classical um, world who can uh, take music off the page, whether, you know, you could have a violinist who can interpret Bach solo violin music off the page and memorize it and perform it um, like at the highest order and be the, and, and be um, kind of at the, the pinnacle of that art form. But uh, if you ask them to come play along on a, a folk song, like they wouldn't have the, those tools to kind of approach improvising over, you know, a, you know, a fairly simple piece of music that a lot of folk musicians will play by ear. I'm like, I don't, I'm not trying to generalize classical musicians in general, but there's, this is an example. It's just like it's just a completely different art form, yeah. Um, where a lot of it is uh, off the page and not done by ear or intuitively. And you know, bluegrass is this oral tradition. Like it was only in the '60s when people started writing books about how to play banjo or, or putting these you know classic songs into tablature. Um, it's a you know it's a fairly new art form. Our style of music really crystallized in the '40s, and then you know it took 20 or 30 years before people started teaching it via books, and now it's being taught in you know university classrooms yeah. and stuff. But the you know it's the, the ultimate irony of, of bluegrass or folk music is it being learned off of the page and not you know um, learned intuitively or shared. Publicly, you know, the I think the, um, the one of the greatest things about bluegrass is like the improvisatory nature of it, the spontaneity of what happens when um, people play this stuff live on stage, and it's it gives you really have a head start if you're learning this stuff out of a book where you have tablature telling you where to put each finger and what picking pattern to use. They can really give you a kind of a a starter boost, yeah. Um, but when you get um, addicted to that of needing to have something right in front of you telling you where to put your fingers, um, then you've kind of lost a, a big part of the, the whole tradition. Now, are so, you? Yeah. I'm sorry, as you were saying. You know, that's that's just, that's a okay. You know, jumping off point there. Well, as uh, as an instructor, are you learning just as much from your students as you are teaching? Um, I think there's a, um, there's a real reward in, in preparing, um, kind of your, uh, thesis statement, like, uh, on how you play the instrument or, or how to approach the instrument. And I've, I've noticed that the times that I've put in, um, trying to prepare for, um, workshops or talks about how to play banjo or, or you know about music i've um kind of been more rigorous with myself of trying to really have a neatly organized and concise um argument as far as how i approach the instrument yeah. it almost forces you to kind of um to refine your own um argument or thesis as far as like your your approach to the instrument or ethos on the instrument and so i feel like that um it's the the preparation that goes into it and um the the only i think that becoming a better teacher is reliant on working with students and, and getting feedback from them and seeing how people internalize um 
what what you've uh, put together. And so it's definitely a, a back and forth, something I, I enjoy. What it, you know, you, you got a, a lot of, uh, I guess maybe even influence and instruction from uh, Greg and special consensus. What did he teach? Uh-huh. What did he teach you um, that has stuck with you through the years in terms of advice and also technique? Greg Cahill. Yeah. Um, I think he was the he was the guy who, who really kind of planted the seed for me to be a, a musician first and foremost, the banjo player, a musician who plays the banjo, you know, in that order. Um, he he was when I first met him. It was before I played with any bands, and I, I really kind of started studying with him because I was getting ready to kind of make that leap into playing with um, some local groups when I was a teenager and like I needed him to kind of whip me into shape so I could like essentially get off of the page yeah. and play stuff intuitively and use my ear and um, he I, when, when I started working with Greg we, we, there were no books in front of us anymore it was all um, mostly by ear or if we want if I wanted him to show me something um he would write it out you know as we went along and something he probably never used in the lesson prior to um when we had talked about it and so he's just you know greg um is a you know a, a, a real treasure um i think within the bluegrass world um he's cultivated this brand of special consensus for i think almost 40 years now yeah. maybe 40 years and his band has been a clearinghouse and like it's just an institution and the inspiration um, and encouragement that he's given the musicians over the years is just, you know, it's a real profound um, contribution. And when I discovered um, that Greg lived in the same town that I live in just outside of Chicago in the Northern suburbs, it was just like, it was like winning the lottery. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I really cherished those, most times getting to study with him. Well, my last question is, um, now that you've become uh, a master level instructor and also a beloved performer, what has surprised you the most about this journey with the banjo, about the instrument and uh, your connection to it? Oh, um, well, I think the... It maybe shouldn't have been surprising, um, but I, I still am uh, really kind of blown away just by the um, this endless well of, of creativity um, uh, kind of displayed by people playing these instruments, whether it be a banjo players, mandolin players, like just um, the, the more people you're around, the, the more inspiration you're, you'll find. Um, I'm really inspired to, to see this new kind of crop of, of young players coming up. There's uh, every, um, you know, I, I, my, I probably spend 95% of my time as a performer and 5% of my time as a, you know instructor. And so I do it from time to time. Um, and the last time I was involved with uh, a seminar was down in Savannah, Georgia. Um, they have this thing called the American Music Sem- Seminar that's part of the Savannah Music Festival. And it's a week-long um, uh, kind of seminar where they have maybe a dozen or two dozen uh, instrumentalists and from all over the world, um, you know, through really the brightest lights in, in guitar and banjo and bass, and like any, any folk instrument. There was an, an amazing hammered dulcimer player there, or sorry, mountain dulcimer player there this year who blew me away. And I was just, uh, you know, it just put a big smile on my face to, to see um, the level um, that these players are playing at. And more importantly, like just the ideas that they're having. Like it's one thing to find uh, people who are great technicians, but coming away from that seminar this year, you know, it was around all these young players and it's like, well, these people have, have the chops, but they also have ideas. They have stories they want to tell through their music. And that, that really bodes well for the future of this music.